This meeting is being recorded. Shant, can you stop the recording? We'll do it when I start the thing. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. How do I do that? I have made. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. I am Rajdeep Pundir. I am the co-founder and CEO at Revisor. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Uh, thanks for joining in on a Saturday morning, as you all are aware. So in today's session, we are gonna talk about SATs and ACTs exam. And predominantly, we're gonna talk about study abroad as a vertical, right? So I think that is what the theme is going to be. Uh, the, the format is very straightforward. For the first 35, 40 minutes, I'll walk you guys through the SATs, ACTs, PSAT, the different kinds of exam. When, why, and how should you be taking these exams? Who should be taking these exams? What are the right timelines in terms of when you should be taking the exam? So I'll try and answer those questions. By the end of it, I hope you will have a lot of clarity with regards to these two exams about SATs and ACTs and how are these two tests different from each other. And then at the end, we will open the forum for Q&As. In between, if you guys have any questions, please feel, feel free to put them in the chat section. And we will take up all the questions live at the end of the webinar, right? So hope, hope that's clear. With that, let me quickly jump onto the session today. As I've already discussed, these are going to be the key takeaways from the webinar for today. Let me just give a quick brief about the company. So we are a high school support company. We assist students worldwide achieve their high school academic goals. Even in today's webinar, we have uh, parents and families from Singapore, uh, Qatar, uh, Indonesia, India, and a couple of other countries. We largely work with students from grade nine to grade 12. We have two major verticals within the company. The first one is test prep, where we help students who are looking to go outside of, uh, predominantly in US, for SATs, ACTs, and AP exam prep. And then we have the other vertical, which is in the academic tutoring domain, where we do IGCSC, IB, and A-level, or British curriculum academic tutoring help as well. Uh, we've been doing this for about seven years now. We have helped 4,000 odd families or students. Uh, we've served across eight plus countries, 20 plus cities across India. We are headquartered out of India. Uh, most of our people are based out of India. Some of them are based out of Dubai. Uh, so that's, that's about the company. With that, let me jump on to the application process. If you really try and understand how the application process really works, and I will try and do a contrary analysis with regards to the Indian admission. Uh, the If you really look at the Indian admission, everything is largely based on one exam, right? So for example, if you're looking at getting into engineering, you have to write, let's say, JEE. If you are looking at medicine, you have to write NEET exam. And similarly, there are other exams, CLAT for law and so on and so forth, right? And all of these exams are something that you write post your grade 12. And then you, based on your ranks, you get admissions, right? However, if you look at admissions outside of India, they're not based on any one particular test. They are a lot more holistic in terms of their approach, in terms of the admission process. And when I talk about outside of India, I'm talking about US, UK, Canada, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia. So these are the geographies that I'm broadly classifying when I'm saying outside of uh, India. Now, if you really look at outside of India, there are four major pillars that I say that you really need to focus on. The first one is academics. And when I say academics, you're largely looking at grade 9, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade scores. These are the four years scores which are super important when you're looking to apply outside of India. Unlike India, where it's only your grade 12 scores which are important, right? So I think that becomes an important factor here. The second part is the standardized test scores. I think there are certain exams that you need to write and that's irrespective of whatever major you are planning to apply for. For example, even if it is uh, engineering, medicine, law, I mean, any exam that you, I mean, any major that you want to pursue, you still have to write an exam called SAT or ACT if you're looking to go outside of India. And then there are other exams like, you know, IELTS and TOEFL and other exams that you also need to write apart from this. So that's the standardized test score. That's your second pillar. The third pillar is profile building. And now what is profile building? Profile building is nothing but when an individual has to showcase to the college that you are looking to go for this particular major, then you have to show them why do you, why are you interested in a particular major, right? So anything and everything that you do in your journey for the next three to four years, which is in grade 9, 10, 11, largely helps you build your profile, right? It could be internship, it could be research work, 
uh, it could be blog writing, it could be some sort of internship that you have done, uh, some sort of community service, it could be your extracurricular activity. So all of that becomes part of your profile building activity. And then you have the fourth pillar, which is nothing but the college application, which largely comes in grade 12, which includes shortlisting of universities. First, obviously, the geography, the country where you want to apply, then shortlisting of universities, then the essays, and then the letter of recommendation. So all these four pillars put together really helps you get admission outside of India. So when you're evaluating your options or your chances to get an admission into a top college, these are the four parameters on which you get evaluated. If you are in grade 9th and 10th and 11th, this is where you need to start working on. With that, I think for today, our focus is largely going to be on the standardized test. And we will try and deep dive into these exams and we'll try and answer all the questions and help you understand what these exams are. The first test uh, that we need to talk about is SAT. So we are going to talk about the digital SAT, which used to be SAT earlier. Now it's called a digital SAT. Uh, it's connected by an organization called College Board. Uh, College Board is a US-based organization which conduct these exams across the globe. They are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, SAT happens seven times a year, which is in the month of March, May, June, uh, August, October, November, and December. So these are the seven different dates when SAT happens. You could take the exam as many times as you want. However, we recommend students to take it twice, maybe not more than that, at, at worst th thrice, but not more than that. Uh, the reason why we are okay with two attempts, because there's a reason for it, because there are certain set of colleges which allow you to do super scoring, right? Now, what is super scoring? Super scoring basically means you can actually take English from one particular test and you can take the math score from the other test, right? And so there are certain colleges which allow you to super score. And in that case, it's always better to have, uh, you know, done digital SAT twice rather than once because your super score will always be better than your regular score, right? So I think that's one reason why people end up writing it twice or probably more than that as well. Now, with regards to the exams logistics, so it roughly about a two hours, 14 minute exam. There are broadly two sections which are which are being which you are being tested on, which is largely English and maths. It's required by most US colleges and also helps in many other geographies. Uh, I would like to probably go deep into this statement. It says required by most US colleges, right? So what do I why do why have I said most? Because there are when you start looking at colleges let's say predominantly in US, you will encounter on their admission website, they will use these three terms. And I think it's important for you to understand these three terms. The first term is test mandatory. Any college would say they are test mandatory. That means you have to have your SAT and ACT scores to apply to these colleges. So you have to do these exams. There is second type of college which say they are test optional. When they say test optional, that means if in case you have done the SAT score, you need to submit it. If you have not, then you can skip it. So that those are the colleges which are test optional. And I think this is a term which only came into existence during the pandemic because there were a lot of countries across Africa where SAT could not, uh, college board could not conduct the SAT. And hence, colleges made it optional just to make it fair to everybody. However, if you really ask anybody in your network to the counselors, to companies like ours, uh, you will realize that everybody has noticed that if we were applying from countries like India, Singapore, Dubai, and other countries where SAT actually happened even during the pandemic. It was always advisable and any student who was who had not submitted the SAT score was at a disadvantage. And hence, if you see any place where it says test optional, please try and make sure that you're doing the SAT exam and then submitting it. Uh, don't consider it to be, uh, to be optional. The third category of colleges are test blind. Test blind are the colleges which will not see your SAT scores or ACT scores at all. And for example, all universities in California, right? All universities in California have been test blind for years now, right? So if you're planning to apply to such universities, you don't have to worry about writing the SAT. If you're very, very clear that California is the only place where we are going to apply. Those universities are known as test blind. So they are test blind basically, right? So that's why I said required by most US colleges. Then the second statement helps in many other geographies. The reason because SAT is not just in US, uh, even in Canada, even in Singapore, even in Hong Kong, some places in UK, uh, some, some colleges in India as well have started accepting SAT scores. And hence the acceptance of digital SAT is much higher now as compared to what it was earlier. Now, 
what are the different things in digital SET? So the new digital SET is adaptive in nature. That means depending on your performance in one module, your next module difficulty level will get decided. So for example, if we are 50 people here on the webinar today, if we go and write the digital SET today, all of us will have a same first section paper. However, depending on our performance, our next paper will get, our next module will get decided. So I think that is what I meant by adaptiveness. And I think you might have certain questions with regards to how was the, how the scoring works. I mean, I will take that up in the next part. It'll only have two sections instead of four. I think that is very, very important. So you have English and maths. And within the English, you have two modules, module one and module two. And within the maths, itself, you have two modules, module one and module two. Uh, you can use your own device. So you can actually carry your own devices to the exam hall. Uh, there's a clock on the screen to assist with time management. Even if you're not carrying a digital watch, it's completely fine. You can easily move, move between the questions because now it's digital and it's no longer a pen and paper. Uh, you can actually flag the questions which you want to come back and revisit. it. All the math formulas are accessible all at one place. So that's again an advantage that you have. The test is much shorter now as, it, as, com as compared to what it was earlier. It's only a two hour, 14 minute test. Uh, they were, there are no longer long reading passages. So earlier there used to be long reading passages and then you have to read the entire passage and answer the 10 question. But now that has changed. You only have a para. So you have to read a particular para and answer the question. So I think that's major difference, which has happened. Questions are a lot more concise. They're a lot more straightforward. You have more time per question and there are lesser number of questions. Uh, you're allowed to use calculator all throughout the math section, which is again, a very, very welcome change. And because it's a digital exam now, scores are available much faster in days rather than weeks. So I think that's another advantage of having this exam being digital. Now let's try and understand how does the scoring works, right? I think since I said that it is an adaptive exam, then how would the scoring really happen in adaptive exam? So consider it like this, right? You have two stages. There's stage one and there is stage two. Uh, so for English, you have stage one. And for English itself, you have stage two. Now let's assume we all write the exam and one of us got 16 out of 20. And let's assume there are 20 questions. So let's say in stage one, one of you got 16 out of 20. That means you fall in this bracket. That means your minimum score that you can get in English now is 680. The maximum that you can get in English is 800. That means your upper limit and a lower limit of your score gets decided depending on your performance in stage one. And that is super important. And your stage two paper is going to be difficult as well. Because it's difficult, even if you end up not doing well, you still get a 680 here, right? However, let's assume I write the exam and I got 9 out of 20. I fall in this basket. That means the maximum that I can score is 560. The minimum I can score is 440. Even if my stage 2 paper is easier here, the maximum that I can get is 560 only. That's how the adaptive scoring works. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to put it up in the chat section. Happy to take it up at the end. The same thing will happen for maths as well, like it would happen for English. And finally, your overall score gets decided. And I think from here, you probably would have gotten the idea that SET is out of 1600 points, 800 in English and 800 in maths. So that's your overall of 1600 uh, in total that you have. Uh, if you score above 1500 plus, you are in the 99th percentile bracket. So I think that's a, a benchmark that you need to set for yourself. You're looking to go into uh, applying for top colleges outside of India. Let's try and understand some of the numbers here. As I said, there are two sections, reading and writing. Uh, one section, maths is another section. Uh, in the reading and writing, you have a total of 54 questions and you have 64 minutes to solve these. In maths, you have a total of 44 questions and you have 70 minutes to solve these questions. Uh, scoring wise, minimum is 200, maximum is 800, as I said. Uh, so that means the maximum that you can score is 1600 overall including both the sections. Let's, now let's try and deep dive into individual sections. Now, when you look at English, as I said, there are in each of these sections, you have two stages or two modules. So we call this two stage adaptive test design. There are total of, let's say in, in case of English, you have a, you have a total of 52, 54 questions in total. That means 27 in each of the modules. So 27 in module one, 27 in module two. And for solving 27 module question, you have 32 minutes in totality. Now, I think the important part here is out of 27 questions, there are 25 questions which are operational questions. That means there are 25 which are operational and two which are experimental questions, right? Now, what do I mean by that? There are two questions which will not be accounted towards your final score. However, as a student, you still have to do all your 27 questions with equal focus because you wouldn't know which are those two questions which are experimental in nature here. And hence, you have to do all the 27 questions in the given 32 minutes. 
in totality, you have roughly about 1.19 minutes per question. And I think this is very, very important point for you to note because I will be doing a comparative analysis with ACT. So in ACT English, you have 1.19 minutes per question. So I think that's an important point to keep, take away from here. As I said, you have short reading passages. You're reading a para and answering the question. The questions are largely focused on four major content domain, which we will look into the next slide. Uh, the test, as I said, is largely divided into two modules, module one and module two for English. The passages of the para, which have been taken, they have been taken from different areas. It could be literature, history, social studies, humanities, sciences. And I think that is very, very important point to note here that, you know, one of the reason or one of the things that I've seen Asian students not able to reach beyond a certain score in SET is largely because of the reading section, right? We really, really struggle with the reading section. I think we do exceptionally well in maths, but we end up not scoring not so good in English section. And that's because of our reading habits, right? Uh, a, a lot of us don't read. B, even if they read, they end up reading a lot of fictional stuff. However, here, if you really look at it, they're testing you on different zoners, literature, history, social studies, humanities, sciences. So I think one of the things, if you really want to do well in your SETs, start reading. If you're not an avid reader, start reading now. Maybe start reading one or two articles a day. I think that itself would help. Uh, you can always pick up articles from Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and these are the places where you can pick the articles from because, again, these are US-based companies that I'm talking about. And if you're looking at US-based companies, if you look, there, look at these articles, also the grammar rules, which are, if you remember in India or uh, you know, we, we follow British English, right? The, whereas SAT tests you on American English and the rules are slightly different there. So it's important if you're reading these articles, you'll also encounter those rules. You'll also encounter the changes that happens there, right? For example, uh, you know, you can, uh, we, we say that it's A comma B and C, which is right for us. However, in American English, this is wrong. It should ideally be A comma B comma and C. There has to be a comma before and as well, right? I think that's the difference between American English and British English. So there are small, small, minute differences in terms of grammar rules as well that one needs to be cautious about. And hence I'm saying, if you are very, very sure about, you know, uh, writing this exam, you might as well start reading those articles just to get yourself familiarized with those grammar rules as well. Now, as I said, there are four major content domains. They're largely testing on craft and structure information and ideas. These are two predominantly uh, areas focused on your understanding and the reading of your passages and context. I think that becomes super important. And then the next two are standard English convention and expression of ideas, which are largely testing your grammar skills, right? How good are you with your uh, regular sentence structure, usage, punctuation, and rules? Uh, similarly, how well can you understand your rhetorical goals and rhetorical strategies? So I think these are the four major content domain on which you get tested in the English section. Now, in terms of the math section, there are roughly about 44 questions that you will encounter between the two modules. That means 22 in each of them. And you have 35 minutes to solve these questions. Again, just like English, you have 20 questions here, which are operational questions. And there are two questions which are pretest or experimental questions, which I will not be accounted towards your final exam. The average time that you have in SAT math section is 1.59 minutes per question. And I think this is very important point to note again here because uh, again, we will do a comparative analysis when we will do the ACT. So in ACT math, you have about 1.59 minutes per question to solve the ACT math. What are they testing you on? These are the four major content domain, algebra, which includes linear equation, inequality, system equation, uh, problem solving and data analysis, which includes ratio rate, proportion, you know, one and two variable data and so on. Advanced math, which is anything which is non-linear, quadratic equation, exponential equation, all of that is part of advanced math. Geometry and trigonometry, which includes your lines, angle, triangle, area, volume, all of that is part of your geometry and trigonometry concepts. However, if you have noticed geometry, algebra, problem solving, and data analysis is majority of your portions. Geometry and trigonometry is hardly about 10 to 12% of your overall thing, which is again a critical component here because when we will look at ACT, there are certain things which are different here. Right, so please do keep this pointer in mind as well, that you're looking at SED math. It's very, very algebra heavy. There is a very small component of geometry and trigonometry here. Now, with that, we have covered everything which we wanted to cover with regards to the basic information on the SED front. Now, we would like to jump onto the next test, which is ACT, which is called American College Test. Uh, it's conducted by an organization called ACT.org, just like College Board. So I think I, I'm going to do a lot of compare and contrast when I'm looking at these two places. 
uh, ACT just like uh, ACT connected by a different organization called ACT.org. ACT also happens seven times a year. It is a digital exam. It is an online exam. You have to go to a center and write the exam. So from those perspective, ACT ACT is very, very similar. Now let's try and look at the differentiating factor here. Now, I think before I even talk about the differentiating factor, I think one thing that I want to help you emphasize here is nobody has to write both the exams, right? You have to pick and choose the right exam for you, whether it's SAT or ACT, which is the right test for your kid, right? I think that's the call that you really need to take. So please note, you don't have to write both. You have to write either of these exams. The purpose of introducing you to both these exams so that you are making an informed decision. As a child, uh, you need to figure out which is the right test for you and where you can do best. As a college, they are looking at SAT or ACT equally well. I mean, they are not differentiating between these two colleges, especially talking about US. However, there are certain other factors that you really need to consider when you're looking at these exams. And one of the important factors is acceptability outside of US. So if you really look at ACT, ACT's acceptability outside of US is far lesser as compared to ACT. For example, in India, there is no university which accepts ACT score as of now. Uh, but there are almost about 40 plus university which accept SAT scores as of today, right? So I think these are other factors that you need to consider. But if you're very, very sure that the child is going to apply to US only, then whether you do an SAT or an ACT does not make any difference. You need to pick the right exam for the kid. Now, coming back to the differentiating factors between the two exams, ACT, it's about a two hours, 55 minute exam. Plus there's a 40 minute separate optional essay component. Unlike SAT, which was just two hours, 15 minute exam. There are roughly about five sections here. Everything else sort of remains the same. Now, what are these five sections? The first one is English. The second one is maths. The third one is reading. The fourth one is science. This is an interesting one. Uh, and I will come back to this because there's a lot of myth around this science section in ACT. And then there's a fifth component, which is the essay component, which is optional in nature. Each of these sections are scaled on a scale of 1 to 36, 1 being the lowest and 36 being the highest. Essay component is scaled on a scale of 2 to 12, 2 being the lowest, 12 being the highest. So your essay scores are not accounted towards your main score. And hence, we generally recommend that you can skip the essay component now because now SAT does not have essay. Until last year, there used to be an essay component uh, in SAT as well. And then there was some correlation between the two. Now let's try and deep dive into individual section. The first section, as I said, is the ACT English section, wherein you will have a total of 75 questions and you have roughly about 45 minutes to solve these questions. That means you just have 36 seconds per question. I think if you remember from the ACT, ACT English had 1.19 minute per question versus ACT where you only have 36 seconds per question. That means you have to be really, really quick. What they're testing you on is grammar rule in this section, which is very similar to what they're testing on the SAT, but the questions are easier. At the same time, you have to be really, really quick because there are a lot more number of questions that you will encounter. So that's one of the major difference between the two exams that SAT, you will encounter slightly difficult question, but to solve those questions, you have more time. On the ACT, you will encounter slightly easier question, but at the same time, you have less time to solve those questions. So that's a call that you have to take which one are you more comfortable with? In terms of the content that they're testing, it's exactly the same as SAT, usage and mechanics and rhetorical skills. So there is no change from the concepts perspective or topics perspective. The second section that you will encounter in ACT is ACT maths, wherein you have 50, 60 minutes and 60 questions. That means you have one minute per question versus in ACT, if you remember, we said 1.59 minute per question. So you roughly have about you know, 50, 60 percent less time to solve the ACT question. Again, the same thing, the questions are a lot more straightforward here, but you will have a lot more questions here as well, right? So that is what you will encounter in the ACT math section. The, with regards to the topics, I think these are the topics that you will encounter. So there's algebra, there's geometry, there is trigonometry. Now, if you look at it, algebra, you roughly have about 30, 35 questions and the remaining 25 comes from geometry and trigonometry. So that's another difference if you remember that I said. SAT math is very, very algebra heavy. On the other hand, ACT maths, it's equal here in terms of algebra and geometry and trigonometry. It's roughly about 60, 40 split between the two. So if you as a student is very, very comfortable with algebra, you might prefer SAT. However, if you as a student is very, very comfortable with geometry and not so much with the algebra, then you might be looking at ACT. So that's another differentiating factor that you should consider when you're comparing between the SAT versus ACT. Now, with regards to the third section, which is the ACT reading section, you have a total of 40 questions. You have 35 minutes to solve these questions. 
Here you have roughly about 52 seconds per question. Again, very similar to the SAT, no change here. The passages are being taken from very, very different zonas. You have prose, social science, humanities, and natural science, and they are largely testing you on the same uh, conceptual uh, knowledge. And hence, content-wise, they're not much difference. But I think the if you really look at the reading section in ACT, one of the major difference could be you have a slightly easier vocabulary here as compared to what you will encounter in the SAT reading section. So I think that's one of the major difference. The fourth component that you will encounter is the ACT science section. In the ACT science section, you again have 40 questions. You have 35 minutes to solve these questions. The average time per question is very, very similar. You have roughly about 52 seconds to solve these ACT science questions. So I think, again, the major myth here is a lot of parents, a lot of students come to me and say, hey, Rashdeep, you know what? We are not applying to for a STEM course. Do we still need to do the ACT? Because there's a science section here. Or we are applying for a STEM course, then we should be doing ACT, right? Because there's a science section here. And my answer is no. The ACT science, there is no science involved here. It's basically reading. You are reading science-based passages and answering the question. It's as simple as that. Consider it like a reading section. There is no science involved here. The only thing here is you're reading science-based passages and answering the question. That's the only difference that you will encounter here. With regards to the question type, I think there are three broader categories in which you can define these passages. One is data representation passages where there is a lot of data, table, chart, graph given here. You need to read all of that and answer the question. The second type is the research summary type where there's a lot. So let's say I've done an experiment and I have presented the summary of my research along with my experimental results. So there is some part of theory and some bit of experiments or tables involved here that are, are considered under the research summary kind of passages. And then there is third type, which is conflicting viewpoint passages, wherein let's say there are two different people who are presenting a particular viewpoint towards something that's conflicting viewpoint passages. They are obviously much large, I mean, much longer as compared to data representation research summary. And hence, you'll only encounter one such passage out of six, seven passages that you will see in the ACT science section. So that's the larger, broader difference between the two exams, which is SAT and ACT. I hope we were able to help you decide between these two exams, but I'm pretty sure it's, it is still a tough choice. I think what we generally as a company recommend is why don't you go ahead? Now you have a basic clarity. Why don't you go ahead and write a diagnostic test? So here's the website link on which you can go and register yourself for free and write a free diagnostic test. And post the diagnostic, you also get a detailed report analysis saying what areas have done well, what areas you uh, need to improve on. This will help you A, to figure out what kind of questions can you encounter in ACT? What kind of question can you encounter in ACT? Uh, where do you stand in terms of SAT and ACT at this point of time? Uh, what are the areas that you really need to start working on? I think these are the things that this diagnostic test can really help you with. So please go ahead, register yourself here. We'll probably, uh, all the participants who have registered with us, you will anyways get a mail from us by the end of the day where you will get this link and the uh, process on which how you can register and go ahead and do this test. The next exam that you, some of you probably would have also heard, and I, I, I know there are some parents and families here who are with the kid is in grade eight, ninth, and 10, must be thinking about PSAT. And you know, you probably would have heard this term from your schools. It's called practice SAT or preliminary SAT, which is nothing but a short end and a simplified version of the SAT, right? It's exactly same as SAT. I think content wise, there is no difference between the SAT versus PSAT. It's just that PSAT is going to be a shorter version of the SAT. You will encounter slightly easier question, but questions on the similar topics. I think that's the thing that you really need to keep take away from. I think the important thing that I want to answer here is why should one be doing PSAT, right? Because PSAT is not required for admissions. Let me be very, very straight here. No college will ask you to apply with your PSAT scores, right? So you don't have to do PSAT for college. PSAT is not mandatory at all. Then why do people write PSAT, right? I think that's the next bigger question that some of you might have. Uh, so there are three broader reasons why people end up writing PSAT, right? So one of them is some of them write PSAT because they want to know where the child stand at this point of time globally, because PSAT is conducted like SAT. So you get your global rank, I mean, global percentile and everything, right? So that's one reason. The second reason some people write PSAT because I don't know how many of you have heard for profile building. Some people also go for summer school program, right? So let's say this is a summer school program by Yale. There's a summer school program by John Hopkins. So when you're applying for these summer school programs, 
you can actually submit your PSAT scores there and that can play some critical role in terms of your admission for that summer school or for scholarship for that summer school. So that's another reason why some people write PSAT because they want to apply for summer school program. The third reason why some people also write PSAT is because of the NMSQT, which is National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. So if you are a student who is in grade 11, and if you are a US citizen, and if you write PSAT in grade 11 and you are a US citizen, you are also considered for a scholarship called NMSQT, National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test. Depending on your performance in your PSAT grade 11 score, your final ranking comes out and based on that, you might be eligible to get certain scholarships. So that's another reason why some people write PSAT. So I hope I was able to clear why do you really need to write PSAT. Now, based on these three factors, if you're looking at any of these three, you should write PSAT. Otherwise, you can simply skip the PSAT. It's completely fine. It is not required for your admission. With regards to the content, it's exactly the same as SAT. It's just that it's slightly a shorter version. So unlike 1600 of SAT, PSAT is a 1520 exam, uh, right? So, so it's slightly shorter version as compared to what you will encounter in the SAT exam. Now with that, I think we have covered the three tests that we wanted to cover today. Uh, I would like to explain you, I think the important part, which is the timeline, right? What is the right time? So we spoke about, I want to revisit the first slide that I had in my presentation, which was about four different pillars. So there was to revisit the first pillar was academics, which is super important. The second pillar was standardized test. The third pillar was profile building. The fourth pillar was college admissions. Now I want to revisit those four pillars. The first is academics, 9, 10th, 11th, 12th grades. They're super, super important in your admissions process. Second profile development, which is happening across the four years, your internship, research work, paper writing, uh, community service, anything and everything that you do comes under your profile de development aspect. The third component is nothing but your standardized test. And fourth is your college application. College application happens only in grade 12. So you don't have to worry about this until grade 12. Now coming to the standardized test, what is the right time to do these exams? So let's look at the PSAT. You can write PSAT in grade 9. You can write PSAT in grade 10. You can write PSAT in grade 11. You, you should write PSAT in grade 11 only if you are a US citizen so that you are eligible for NMSQT. Otherwise, don't write PSAT in grade 11. If you're not done until grade 10, forget about it and leave it, right? You don't even have to write it. So that's one. PSAT is conducted by the school. In some cities, some schools don't conduct it. Then you will have to figure out another school within the same city, which conducts and takes private candidate as well. So that's an option through which you do the PSAT. Uh, PSAT happens only once a year. So that is another important information to note. Then the other exam that we talked about were SAT and ACT. Grade 10th is a good time for you to test the waters. I think that's the time when you should take your diagnostic test, see where you stand. And depending on that, you should decide whether you want to start preparing for it while you are in grade 10th, or you should definitely start when you're in summer break of your grade 10th. That means the moment you're done with your grade 10th board exams, you should definitely start with your SAT, ACT prep. Uh, I would say earlier than that is ideal, but if not, summer break, definitely you should start. And in your grade 11, early first semester, which is around October, November is when you should be doing your first SAT attempt. Depending on your score, you could do it in December or March. That could be your second attempt for SAT. So that before you even start your grade 12, you're done with your SATs and ACTs exam. Those are the timelines. If you're in grade 11th right now, start as soon as possible, dial us up and you know set up your one-on-one -on -one call with us. If you're in grade 12, you're already late, start today, right? Uh, I think that would be the advice. Uh, you would see another exam that we have mentioned here called AP exam, which is called advanced placement exams. Uh, you know, keeping in mind the amount of content that I've already given, I don't want to confuse you guys, but uh, we have a webinar which is happening, you know, two Saturdays from now, uh, I think about 23rd or 24th of uh, um, this month. Uh, please feel free to drop us a message and we'll send you the link to register for that where we are going to talk about AP courses. AP courses stands for advanced placement courses and they are super, super important if in case you are a student coming from CBSC, ICSC or state background because AP helps you to stand out in college application process. AP helps you to gain college credits. Uh, I think it's super important in gaining a lot more popularity because AP helps you showcase your expertise in different subjects, which you can't do through the SATs. Earlier, there used to be something called subject SATs through which you could do this. 
but now subject SCTs are no longer offered and you only have APs uh, through which you could do this, right? And APs can be done in grade eight, grade, grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, also in grade 12, but there is different reason why and when you should be doing it. I would, you know, extensively cover all of this in the next webinar, which is happening two Saturdays from now. So these are the testing timelines. However, I know these are generic timelines. If any one of you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, set up a one-on-one -on -one call. Uh, it's, it's a free 30 minute consultation session that we offer from our side. We would sit with you and help you make this plan for your child and figure out what is the right time for them to do the ACT, ACT, APs, PSAT and all of that. So I think feel free to dial us up and we'll be happy to set up a call with you. Now, as I said in the beginning, we will also talk about what are the colleges in India that accept SAT scores. So these are some of the famous universities, Ashoka, Azim, Premji, Flame, Kriya, Shivnadar, Plaksha, Manav, Rachnas. These are some of the famous universities which accept SAT scores in India. There are a total of roughly about 44 universities as we speak, which are already signed up uh, with the college board, which accepts SAT scores for the admissions. So I think even if for some reason this becomes your plan B, India is your plan B, even there, uh, SAT scores are important uh, or you can do it. And, but I think some of you might have a question that why can't I write you know, an exam which is offered by Ashoka, right? You can definitely do that. But think about it. If you're applying to, let's say, top five universities, you will you'll end up writing five different exams. Instead of that, you write SAT and you can use the same score for all these five universities. That's the advantage of doing SAT rather than doing their individual test. And except, SAT is equally acceptable like their own test as well. So, so please uh, feel free to do that as well. So yes, I think with that, we have covered everything with regards to the SAT, ACTs, PSAT, the standard testing timelines. I'll quickly take another two minutes where I will explain how Revisor as a company helps students prepare for these exams. We define, uh, so this is our pedagogy that we follow. We define our program into four phases. We call it phase zero, one, two, and three. Phase zero is about diagnostic test, which is free of course, anybody can come and do it. Uh, which is largely for us to figure out where the child is starting at this point of time. What are the areas they've done, done well, areas they need to improve. And also for us to figure out what is the ideal program for the student, right? So the current program that I'm going to explain you is a full program, but we also have other versions of these programs. Uh, once the phase zero is done, we move to phase one. Phase one is where we do roughly about 35 to 40 hours of live online tutoring. Uh, this is all happening online uh, across the globe. Uh, after for every 40 hours of session, there are 40 hours of assignment that the student is doing. And there's a tracker through which we are also tracking the score performance and figuring out where what are the areas where student has not done well. Once this gets over, we move to phase two. In phase two, we assign a dedicated mentor to every student. This mentor, so irrespective of whether you've done phase one in group training or in one-on-one -on -one setting, we do phase two only and only in one-on-one -on -one settings. We have a dedicated mentor assigned to every student. This mentor will analyze the scores from the phase one assignment for every student, figure out the areas where they've done well and the areas where they still need to improve on, and accordingly figure out and make a study plan for this individual. And there is a weekly check-in that happens by the mentor in terms of the performance of the child and figure out and provide them support, which is required to improve in the areas where they're not done well. Once this gets over, and this is the point where they're doing a lot of sectional practices. Once this gets over, they move to phase three, which is largely about mock tests, the full length test, and where students would do at least about 10 to 15 full length tests before they write their final exam. Every test that they get right, they get a detailed report saying what areas they've done well, what areas they need to improve, and mentors will continue to sit with these students one-on-one -on -one to analyze these mistakes and help them improve on those areas. All of this is happening on our platform with the digital ST being in place. We have our own digital ST platform where all the tests, everything happens on the platform itself, which is very, very similar to what you will encounter in the actual exam. And all these questions are being created by, uh, created and crafted by our faculty, experienced faculties itself. Now, this is how the full program works and we do provide you support for two attempts. So even if, let's say you, right the first time you don't get the desired score, we will provide you the support for your second attempt as well. So that's the full program. However, as I said, the idea here is to figure out what is the right fit for the child because we strongly believe that you know, one size is not fit for all. Uh, if you think you are going to add maths and you just need help with the English, you could do that as well. So you could just do the English only program. You could also do the maths only program. We also have a self-paced program, which is you know self-study program where you get the entire course material and everything from us and you do it, you do the prep on your own. You also have just the mock test series program where you could just do the- Just a second, sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh...
where we also have a mock test series uh, program, which is the ACT ACT uh, light program, right? So these are different modules that we have uh, across Reviser. Uh, as I said, again, feel free to set up a one-on-one -on -one call. We are happy to figure out a do a diagnostic and provide yeah. more information with regards to this as well. With that, I think we have covered up all the topics that we wanted to discuss. Uh, these are some of the numbers where you can uh, call us up. Uh, feel free to call us up on these any of these numbers. If you're calling from India, from Dubai, uh, these are the number that you can use. Uh, drop us a WhatsApp message and we will try and reach out to you at the earliest possible and help you set up the call. With that, let me start taking up the questions from the chat section. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to put it up onto the chat and we'll start taking up questions from there. Okay, I have first question. What about the digital SD? So, Arab, I think we have, I think, oh, okay. So, you have asked this question very, very early. So, we have only covered digital SD. I hope that is clear now. Another question from Harmeet, sir. We will get pen and paper for our rough work. Yes, uh, hum, sorry, Hamrit Kaur. Yes, Hamrit, you will get the uh, pen and paper for your rough work. Another question from Shweta Do Australian colleges accept SATs for undergrad courses? Uh, they do, but it's not mandatory, Shweta. You don't have to have the SAT scores uh, for the admission. You can actually apply without even having the uh, SAT scores to, uh, to Australia. Another question from Sangeeta Ajwani. Any books you can recommend for SAT? Uh, I wouldn't recommend anything, Sangeeta, right now because uh, the digital SAT has started only from this March. So in market, you won't find any books which are readily available or for the digital SAT. If you really still want to use some resource, I would say go and visit the Khan Academy. That's a freely available resource for anyone and everyone to use. And the question from Gauri, can we give both exams ST and ACT? I hope I have answered that question, Gauri. Uh, and I think this question was asked earlier. Yes, you can give both, but we wouldn't recommend you to do both because you will require, I mean, it requires some effort and time, right? You might as well use that time in doing something else. Um, another question from Priya Kapoor, is PISA taken in India also? Definitely Priya, PISA is taken in India as well. Another question from Hamrit, uh, what if we are not able to give PSAT as a school does not conduct it? I think I have answered that question, Hamrit. You don't have to worry about it. There are two options. If one is you don't have to write it. Second, if you really still want to write it, you can figure out other school in your city itself. Uh, which are conducting PSAT and you can apply as a private candidate there. You can write to the college board informing that your school does not conduct it. They will give you the options in, in terms of the schools which allow students from outside of uh, outside of their school to do this exam. Uh, and the question from Sangeeta, what is the correlation between SAT and scholarship? There is no correlation as such, Sangeeta, between SAT and scholarship. Uh, Scholarships are always based on overall profile and it has nothing to do with just the SAT. As I said, admissions in US are very, very different. They are completely based on a lot more holistic approach, which is that's why they're looking at your academics of four years. They're looking at your test prep. They're looking at profile. And then they're looking at your essay, the letter of recommendation and everything. So SAT directly is not correlated to scholarships. Uh, and the question, can you share the slides? Uh, sorry, Sangeeta, we will not be able to share the slides, uh, but you will be getting the recordings of this webinar uh, on your mail if you have registered. Uh, however, it looks like you are from some school. I can see Ross International. Could you please feel free to reach out to us, write to us. Uh, we are happy to conduct. So, so currently we work with a lot of international schools as well. We are happy to conduct it, this webinar or seminar for your schools as well, uh, if required. And the question, so please recommend books for SAT. Uh, I think I've answered that question lab. Uh, unfortunately, you know, earlier there were a lot of books for SAT, but I would say go and use Khan Academy. I think that's the good resource for you to start with uh, if you really want to start preparing uh, on your own at this point of time. Uh, thanks, Ayush. I think Ayush has also uh, put up the invite for AP webinar. So if anybody here is interested in joining us for the AP uh, webinar, which is happening on 22nd of July, uh, here, I mean, I think there is a link here. Please feel free to register there. Please would like to know about APs. Definitely, Sangeeta, as I said, uh, here is the webinar link. Please feel free to register yourself there. Uh, and I think what we will also do is we will also... Uh, uh, Sangeeta, write to us if in case you are from school and we can probably conduct it for your school separately. 
And the question from Hamrit, sir, SAT in Indian college is applicable for a foreign student only or Indian student? No, it is for Indian student, Hamrit. SAT in Indian colleges is applicable for any student, whether they are from India, outside of India, doesn't really matter. Uh, Abby, thank you very much for your informative webinar. Truly appreciate your time. Thanks, Abby. Glad that you like it. Um, and the question from Madan is SAT available only on digital? So if yes, SAT is available only on digital. Uh, unlike unless you are in US, in US you still have pen and paper SAT happening up until December this year. So you still have uh, August, October, November, December. So next four attempts are going to be pen and paper in US. And after that, even there, it's going to be digital. But outside of US, everything is digital right now. Tanush, if for ACT, science test is compulsory. If the student has not taken science in 11th, how does it work? I think I have answered this question indirectly, Tanush. Yes, science test is compulsory because this is one of the mandatory sections that you have to do. But as I've said, there is no science as such, right? So you are only reading the science-based passages. You are reading the science-based passages and answering the question. So even if you don't know science behind it, it's completely okay because consider it like an unseen passages and do it, right? So you don't have to have the science in your 11th and 12th. So I hope I'm able to answer that question because that's, I mean, I wanted to clear that myth very, very strongly here. Uh, another question from Lucky. Do you need to do an AP if you are an IB board? Do you have only mock test series for SET? Uh, yes, Raki, you can do APs even if you are in IB board. We have had students in the past. I mean, this year we had about 200 students who wrote APs with us. The results just came out two days back. Uh, there are, you need to really figure out why do you want to do APs, right? I think that is super important uh, to figure out. One of the reasons for writing APs could be because you are doing it for, uh, you know, standout in college application. You're doing it sometime for college credits. Uh, for some of the IB students, you want to do it because you feel that you have not done well in a particular subject, but you still think you are good at it. You can do show that by doing an AP. In some cases, because IB has certain limitations with regards to SL and HL, but if you want to write an AP for another additional subject, uh, you could you want to showcase your interest in a particular subject, you could do it by writing AP. So there are different reasons why people who are in IB board also end up writing APs. Do you only have mock test series for SAT? Yes, we do have uh, only mock test, series, uh, mock test series for APs as well. We call it SAT light. So when you reach out to any of our uh, you know, staff, ask them for SAT light program. Another question from Raj Vevilala. My son is math, economics, and commerce in 12, planning to do under graduation in India in good college. Will SAT exam help him? As I said, uh, we have a list of, and uh, there is a list of 40 colleges in India, which accepts SAT scores. If you plan to apply to any of these colleges, yes, the SAT scores will help. Otherwise, it will not. And the question of Soham, will the recording for this webinar be available? Yes, Soham, we will be sending out the recording for this webinar. Uh, and the question from Sonia, what should be the extracurricular activities to start at 11? It's a very broad question, Sonia. I can feel free to drop me a message. Happy to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Uh, you know, it can't be random, right? I think extracurricular activities have to be linked to what major you want to do, what colleges you want to apply. And based on that, the profile building has to happen. It can't be, you know, just do this and do that, right? Uh, so as I said, it's a very, very personalized process uh, depending on what you plan to do as a major. And based on that, we work backwards. So feel free to drop us a message and we'll help you with that. Uh, another question was Suma, uh, AP is it self-learning? Do you need coaching? It completely depends on student to student, uh, Suma. You, we have students who come and join us for self-learning courses. Uh, we have students who come and join us for the full training because AP courses are not easy from that perspective. They require a good amount of time commitment. Uh, some kids are able to manage it on their own and some needs help, just like any other exam, right? Uh, so, so you can do either of them. Raj, I think I have answered that question. Um, okay, I think Sonia, I have answered that question as well. What should be the extracurricular activities to start in grade 11? If you're doing IB, then do you need AP? Raki, I think I have answered that question. Uh, Sonia, how many times can I give SAT? As I said in the beginning, Sonia, you can write SAT as many times as you want. Two is an ideal number. Three is the max. Uh, that's the number of times that you can do it. And I think in the beginning of the webinar, I've also explained why who is an ideal number. So, you know, once you have the recording, you probably go and revisit that as well. 
Uh, another question, Raki, do you offer only test series for digital test? I think uh, I've answered this question. Uh, another question from Arav, is AP a necessity for Ivy Leagues and any tips for Ivy board student? Uh, not really, Arav. Nothing is a necessity here. AP is definitely not a necessity for Ivy League. I think it's more about how you are building your profile. You know, is it more academically focused? Is it more, you know, let me give you an example. So I've, I've had student with 1500 score who got into, let's say, an Ivy League versus a 1580 student who did not get, right? Because there are multiple other factors that depends on this, right? So, so I think it's not just about one thing, it's about the combination of multiple things. That's why in, right in the beginning, I talked about those four pillars because I wanted to emphasize that it's not just the SAT that will get you admission, right? It's the combination of all the other factors as well that will really help you to get there, right? I hope that answers the question. Uh, any workshop for IBDP student can be directly trust Khanaka. Any workshop for IBDP, I didn't get that question. Can you please elaborate? Can we directly trust Khan Academy? Um, not sure if I've understood what you meant. Can you trust Khan Academy? You can definitely trust Khan Academy. It's a you know billion dollar uh, not-for-profit venture. I'm pretty sure they're much, much better than any one of us. Uh, but is it enough is the question, right? So because they see, they, 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 they do a basic minimum thing and then you have to build up on it, right? So to start off, I think Khan Academy is a great resource. Nothing can beat that, but you will obviously have to build up on the same. Uh, Pratima session was very informative. Thanks for conducting this session. We'll schedule sometimes a pretty discuss. So thanks, thanks, Pratima. Glad you liked it. Will there be another session like this? I missed starting part. Uh, don't worry, Saiti. Uh, yes, we will have more sessions, but at the same time, we will also be sharing the recording of this webinar. Uh, feel free to go through that. Uh, set up a call with us. Happy to help there. Great session. Thanks a lot, Ankur. But thanks, uh, Ankur. Glad you liked it. I got a 1518 first at NM. Should I give another shot? Definitely no, Arab. Stop that uh, SAT right away. Congratulations on your 1580 first of all. And uh, please don't do any more SAT attempts. Stop doing that. I think start focusing on other profile, right? Uh, work on your profile building. As I said, feel free to call us. Uh, the first number is my number here, 812-382-9822. Uh, feel free to call or drop a WhatsApp message. Uh, and happy to sit with you and help you understand what else can you do, right? 1580, amazing scores. Stop it, SAT. Don't, don't do any more SAT after this. Uh, Gauri Mahajan, does your SAT score provide any scholarship for colleges? Again, I think, Gauri, I did answer that question in the uh, in between. Somebody has asked the relation between SAT and scholarships. Uh, scholarships are given by the college, consider it like this, right? It's a sales, right? So do colleges want you more than you want colleges, right? So that's the question that you're trying to answer here, right? So if you want the college, so if you are applying to a top university where the competition is really high, the chance of scholarship is very, very less, right? However, if you're applying to slightly lower rank colleges where the colleges think you are a good fit for this college and they really want you to be here, then in that case, they might offer scholarship. So SAT is just one parameter, right? Uh, there are multiple other things that they really look at. As I said in the past, I've had students with 1580, 1560 who did not get into top colleges, but a 1500 would, right? Because of everything else that they had in their profile, right? So I think it a lot depends on, so your admission process is a very, very holistic process. It does not just depend on one thing. There are multiple other factors that, that it depends on. How do colleges verify our certification achievements? They they do are I think uh, admission officers are smart enough to figure that out. Uh, there are various ways in which they do it. Uh, you know the digital presence today is very very high, so they are they they are able to do it. You know they they read so many applications they can really figure it out whether it's genuine or not. Perfect. Uh, I think these are the questions that I have encountered so far. Any any other questions? While other people are thinking about the questions, I would like to, uh, I see some of you have already dropped off. I would like to thank each one of you for joining us on a Saturday morning. I hope the session was useful and I hope you got some good information out of this, at least some points to ponder on. Uh, as I said, feel free to reach out to us uh, as and when you want to get more information. Uh, happy to help at any point of time. Uh, we, as I said, on 22nd, there's an AP webinar. If you'd like to join us for the AP as well, there's a link on the chat section. Feel free to go ahead and register. Um, okay, another interesting question from Arav. Do colleges prefer IBDP students? So I think that's an interesting question, Arav, right? So I think, yes, there is slight preference of the IBDP 
uh, over, let's say, the regular Indian board, just because it's a lot more recognized in US from that perspective, right? It becomes easier for them to compare two IBDP students, let's say one coming from Hong Kong, another coming from China, another coming from India, and all have done IBDP. It's easier for them to figure out which one they should pick, right? However, if you're picking a CBSE student from India and let's say some other board in Hong Kong and some other board in China, it becomes difficult because uh, the normalization becomes difficult. So from that perspective, IBDP helps. But at the same time, uh, I mean, I, you know, just a couple of days back, uh, you know, one of the student, I, mean, I just got a call from this parent, this guy is going to Oxford and uh, he's from a state board, like uh, literally from Karnataka state board, right? One of the state in India. So, so it's not like, even if you are not from IBDP, you can't get it. You can definitely get it. But if you are in IBDP, do you have an advanced slight edge? Yes, you do have a slight edge. Uh, another question from Hamrit, sir, if we have done an activity, but we don't have a certificate, how the college will verify. Uh, I mean, it's not about certificates and activities, right? I think uh, it's it's more about the story building, right? I mean, how do you fit this entire thing in your whole holistic part, right? Uh, so don't worry too much about it. I mean, if you think you have done an activity, you don't have a certificate, don't worry, submit it. You you should write it up, right? Don't worry about it because if it is substantial enough, you will have you would have spoken about it in your essay right so they would be able to figure it out so don't don't worry from that perspective even if you don't have a certificate you can still write it they're not going to go and check each and every certificate like you know i won a dance competition i am you in this year that they're not going to go and really check each one of those our ibdp is very rigorous in scoring marks in cbsc is damn easier <laughs> I, can, I can see a student talking here uh so Arav, they, they have their own ways to normalize it. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, they have their own ways to figure that out. And again, if you really think, you know, CBSE is that easy, you know, the question is, you know, do CBSE get 100% and get into college, right? So again, I think those are debatable questions. I don't think, you know, we really need to get into those. I think, uh, you know, colleges are smart enough to figure that out. And, you know, they have their own normalization process. Uh, and the question, sir, will the university accept a prediction or real grades? I'm a Cambridge AS and A-level student. So they will accept your 9th, 10th, 11th actuals and your 12th predicted scores. That's how they will take, right? So 9th, 10th, 11th actual score, 12th predicted score. That's what they will be considering when they're looking at your four-year journey. Sunita Vinod, profile building should be connected to the degree you want to pursue. Definitely, yes. Definitely, yes, right? Because... Uh, if you can align it towards the major, right? I think it will definitely help because it will help you to make it a lot more, uh, lot more in uh, connected conversation, connected story. Uh, but if in case you're not sure about the major, it's, it's still okay. You would still be doing your profile building activity parallelly. Uh, so Nana AP session link. So Nana, you can find the AP session link on the top. Uh, Ayush, can you please share it with Sunayana? Arav, so scoring good in CBSC or scoring average in IBDP, which helps more? <laughs> As I said, uh, Arav, I think this is a different topic. Let's let's take it separately. Uh, you know, Tanush, will A level helps in admission in USA? Again, uh, as I just gave the example, Tanush, right? It doesn't really matter whether it's A-level or IB or CBSE or ICC. You need to do well, right? You need to really do your best and let the college decide, right? Do you have an edge with international curriculum? Yes, you do have a slight edge with international curriculum. That's all that I can probably tell you at this point of time. Arav Agarwal, provisional offers, right? Uh, good question, uh, Arav. So it depends. So UK gives you conditional offer. Now, what is conditional offer? When they give you admission, they say that because they're giving you admission on your predicted scores, they also say that if you get these, these, these scores in these subjects, the offer holds true. Otherwise, they have a right to reject the offer. However, US is unconditional offer, right? US gives offer based on your predicted score and that will hold good even if you don't end up getting the same score Un until unless you end up failing the exam. Then it's a different story altogether. Right? So I think that is an important part. So UK is conditional offer, US is unconditional offer. Great. I think these are all the questions that we have.
Once again, I think mean, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to each one of you here. And I think it great conversation. Arav, I know I may not have been able to justify all your answer questions here. Feel free to call me or message me. I'm happy to have a conversation outside. IB versus CBSC versus A-level. It's a never-ending debate. Uh, but as I said, as a student, just focus on doing well in whichever curriculum you are in. I'm pretty sure you will go to a good college with your SAT scores. Uh, yes, Amrit, your colleges won't be affected in, in USA. Yes. Great. I think those are all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a lovely weekend.